This call of Christ into leadership involves two important things for a leader. It, it involves a, a clarity of, of what we're to do, and it involves a set of skills then off that clarity. We'll be talking about the skills again here in a moment, but, but I want to make sure that I spend enough time here on the clarity issue. Call to be shepherds has to sound like a terrifying thing. Quite frankly, it's easier to run an activity. It's easier to make decisions. It's easier to balance numbers on a page. It's, it's easier to do a lot of things that are hands-off than to actually walk like Christ in the lives of people and, and try to make a difference. So let's park here for a second. There's a passage of Scripture that has been so helpful to me, a passage that, that gives me an orientation and an alignment. It's the one that I'm most discouraged and feel like I'm may, not may, making a difference. It's this passage that helps. When I'm trying to get clarity and say, okay, Lord, what dragons ought we to go slay? Uh, this is a passage. There's a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that I think is a key heart passage. Now, again, we're going to need to know the skills, but my heart has to be centered uh, even more than my skills have to be raised. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, Paul is talking to a church that is struggling on leadership. They, they have leaders who are trying to lead in ways that are not biblical. And Paul simply layers in chapter after chapter, story after story, thread after thread, this is biblical leadership. And let me read a, a core concept about leadership from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll be using the first five verses. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness, and He will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, there's a lot we could unpack from that, but I, I want to take it two concepts out of the first verse. Paul says legitimate leadership when it comes to the heart. As you choose to step into what God's calling you, here are two things. The first one is a word that Paul uses only one time in all of the Scripture, and he uses it here. How ought a leader regard himself? How should other people see a leader? And Paul says in chapter um, 4, verse 1, you ought to regard us as servants of Christ. The normal Greek word for service or servant is, is the word doulos. It's used a lot. This, this word servant is common. But what Paul says in this text is different. Paul uses a different Greek word, one that won't show up ever again. Paul says, you ought to regard us as under rowers. That's the Greek word, under rowers. Well, what he gives them is a visual picture. This visual picture, if you want to know how a leader ought to perceive himself, you want to know what a leader is as God builds the kingdom, and he points almost in their minds to a Roman galley ship, and it's not the person who's attained anything, it's not the person who's in charge of anything, it's not the person who's on top of anything, it's go down to the bottom, and the guy with his hands on the oar, that's who the real leader is. And who the Corinthian church had been parading up as leaders, Paul says, no, that's not how God builds his kingdom, it's with under rowers. You don't achieve to be an under rower. An under rower is somebody that has nothing else in life that has surrendered at all. That concept of leadership that it comes out of weakness, it comes out of inability, it comes out of powerlessness is what Paul's talking about. Leadership is not some story about, hey, I used to be nothing, but now I've kind of pulled myself up, or the Lord's changed me, and now I am something, and so I can lead. It's not that at all. In fact, that's the exact opposite. All leadership comes out of weakness. If we were to take the time and walk through it, here's what Paul does. He begins to talk in chapter after chapter about you need to know how weak and inadequate we are for the task that is ahead of us. Paul says, when we came to you, we came with fear and trembling. 
and we were inadequate to the task. He will say in chapter 4 that we are hard-pressed and all the kinds of things he's speaking about, about looking foolish to people. He will walk it chapter after chapter. If I, if I went to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he will say we were despairing of life, we were beyond our ability to manage it. He will say in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, we're just jars of clay. We don't have any adequacies. And he will move at the end of 2 Corinthians. And in that passage, he will say, I, I had this weakness and I went to the Lord and said, Lord, would you take this weakness away? And the Lord said, no, no. My grace is made sufficient in that situation. That my power will come out of your weakness. Johnny Erickson Tata, um, pretty well known, a lady who, when she was about 17 years of age, dove into uh, in the water, and she uh, broke her neck. She's been a quadriplegic uh, the rest of these years. Her life is incredible. Uh, what she has written and what she has done, her insight, her ability to speak, Johnny has been an incredible, powerful mover in the kingdom. In a very sweet conversation... She began to give this, this insight. She said, I'm, I, I'm asked all the time, Johnny, how do you do it? And she said, what people want is a 30-second answer. And she said, that 30-second answer can't get there. She said, the truth is, you want to know how I do it? She said, I, I can't. She said, at the end of a day, I will say, I can't live as a quadriplegic one more day. This is so hard. She said, there's a misnomer, a misnomer if you're quadriplegic that you that you uh, don't feel pain. She said, that's not true. She said, my husband, Ken, will put me in bed. But she said, I will lay there for a little bit and my hips hurt and my back hurts. And, and she said, I'm so uncomfortable, but I can't move myself. So she said, a few times a night, I will wake him up and ask him to move me. But she said, my husband would get up at four to go to work. And so she said, I, I need to let him get sleep. So she said, I would lay there and I would, I would struggle. And she said, all I could cry out to was, God, you're gonna have to meet my needs. God, you're going to have to be with me. She said, I would have my girlfriends who would come in the morning. And she said, they're going to come at 6.30 or 6 in the morning. She said, I could hear them in the, in the kitchen. They're fixing the coffee and they're getting ready to come in and they're going to wash my face and they're going to brush my teeth and they're going to comb my hair. And she said, I would lay there in bed thinking, I don't have anything for these individuals. God, if you don't meet me, and she said, what it turns out to be is I'm a desperate woman who's powerless, and all I have is to cry out to the Lord. And she said, and my story is this. For 40 years, the Lord has met me every morning. His mercies are new. His grace is powerful. His power he gives to the inadequate. And she said, it has been a grand adventure, a wonderful life from a desperate person that has nothing who could only cry out to the Lord. Your leadership, your being a shepherd in people's life, it will not come out of great adequacy of your life. In fact, I would worry that if you think it does, arrogance will be the great struggle. I have a friend, Glenn, uh, Glenn Elliott. Glenn Elliott said that when he was um, moving into the new role as the senior minister of his congregation, there was a, a bit of a of a team to work with him, a bit of a leadership strengthening team. They brought him in from the outside of their church just to help him in the transition from the youth ministry position to the senior minister. And he said they spent a couple of days with him, and he said they, they took, turned to him one day and said, Glenn, we not, we're not sure that, that you fully understand leadership. And Glenn said, I, I was confused by that because I'd been a leader in high school. I was a leader in college. I, I've been a leader in all my life. And he said, I, I wasn't trying to be dominant or arrogant, but I, but I, was, I was a leader. And, and they said, maybe, Glenn, you better go take a look at, at what it really means biblically to be a leader. Glenn said, I went home that night, and they, they asked me to just read Scripture till I saw biblical leadership. Glenn said, I read all night. He said, I wept most of the night. Because he said, I realized that I had always led out of my instincts, out of things that made sense to me, out of common sense, out of leadership, just it was just what I did. But he said, when I read scripture, I saw it were, used words like 
inadequate and lowly and broken and foolish and suffering and tears. And he said, I realized for the first time in my life, nobody can lead who is not desperate for the Lord, who does not walk into a situation and say, God, I don't know what to do here. These people don't need me. They need you in me, but they need far less of me. I don't know what to do. And he said, it made me a desperate man who the whole of my life would try to do what I wasn't capable of doing. But God would be sufficient if I were desperate enough. The great destroyer, well, the first great destroyer, there's two of them. The first great destroyer of leadership is arrogance. Sometimes it's the blatant, I have to be in charge, I have to have my way, I have to be the center of attention, I have to be right. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's just the quiet arrogance of, I think I know how to do this. I don't have to be center stage, but I can run things. I can make it happen. I can convince people. I, I, I can involve people. But it, it's an unpartnered life, not really partnered with the Lord. This concept in 1 Corinthians, I think, is, is, is why you see so much failure in leadership in all the characters you do. Absalom, his struggle was arrogance. Saul, his struggle was arrogance. When David failed, it's arrogance. Arrogance occurs over and over and over again. And so the first thing that has to happen for any leader at some level is say, I'm over my head. I'm not adequate to the task. And there's almost a wink of God that says, watch this. If you're somebody who will be a worshiper and somebody broken enough about your own life that you will ask me to to walk with you, if you will ask me, if you are dependent upon me, we can lead together. In 2 Corinthians 4, one book later, Paul will make this little comparison. He will talk about in chapter 4 that we are jars of clay. What he's talking about is just cheap jars that you'd buy at any, any place. Jars of clay were nothing special. But he said this, these jars of clay, they hold the great treasure of the gospel. Well, how can these jars of clay do it? Well, he has said in the previous chapter, 2 Corinthians 3, we're worshipers. If you're not a great worshiper, I'm not talking about leading worship in the front of people. I'm not talking about um, praying in public. I'm talking about a desperate man who meets the Lord. If you're not a great worshiper, you'll never be a great leader. Great leaders are people who have beheld the face of God and have spent enough time with God and taken their brokenness and inadequacy to God and who realize I am much like an under rower in a ship. God, if you do not strengthen me, I have nothing to bring. You will never lead well. You see, the great antidote is humility. Lousy leaders struggle with arrogance. Good leaders are rooted in humility. There's a second word in that 1 Corinthians 4 passage. That second word is as vital as the first. In the second one, he begins to talk about the concept that you have a stewardship. It is the word stewardship. We don't use that word often. It seems like a, a different word to our background, stewardship. But he says your stewardship, while you're an under rower, is given to you by God. The best way I know to describe it would be like this. Several years ago, I had a young man who was dating my daughter and wanted to know whether uh, I could have breakfast with him. Well, I kind of knew what that was going to be about. And we sat there, and, and that day, in the sweetest way, he asked me for the blessing to give my daughter to his life. I knew the man. I knew his character, and it wasn't going to be hard to do. But I had to ask the things a father would ask. And I basically asked, will my daughter be safe with you? Will you emotionally and physically, will you look after her? Where will her life be in your hands? And so we had that conversation. But the part I want you to hear is he reached across the table and he took my hand. And not only did he shake it, but he held it for a minute. And Josh said, Mr. Garris, pretty formal that day. Mr. Garris, I give you my word. 
my word of honor. Your daughter will be safe with me the rest of her life. I do love her and I will love her. Now what you need to spot in that, that is the concept of a stewardship, a, a trust. Here's what he has said. The Lord has given you a trust. Go live your leadership. You see, the two great destroyers of leadership are arrogance and cowardliness. When you're not willing to do the hard thing that's called for when you've been given a trust. I spoke in uh, Montana several years ago. Uh, there was a retired military uh, officer and we began to have a conversation and he, and he laughed as we were talking about courage one day and he said, one of the most amazing scenes of courage I ever saw, he said, wasn't involving a battle or a war. He said it involved a, a very swanky base that had lots of officers with lots of clout but had gotten sloppy and lazy as a base. He said a new commanding officer came in and he began to take away all the perks of these officers. And the day that this happened, he said he stood, this commanding officer stood a private, just a lowly private, at a spot on the base, and the private's job was to tell every officer who came up with these perks, no. He said those officers put that young boy through hell. He said they would read him the riot act and what they said to him, and he said at the end of the day, that private had cried in light of all the things said to him. He hadn't pride, cried in, in, in the sight of the guys talking to him, but he was just beat up by them. The man telling me the story said at the end of the day, he said, I saw the commanding officer walk up to that spot to the, to the private. The private obviously saluted his commanding officer, the base commander, and the base commander saluted back, and then the base commander made the young man keep his hands down while the base commander saluted the private. The private didn't know what to do with that, but the, the commanding officer stuck out his hand, shook the private's hand, and said, Son, I know what you went through today, and I know you went through it for me. Thank you. And he shook the man's hand, and he said, Your act of courage and your act of faithfulness means more to me than you'll ever know. I believe this call to go shepherd in the lives of people involves people that are inadequate to do it the whole of their life, but people who have a stewardship. Your title and your office may become, come from somebody's vote, but your call to leadership did not. Your call may never have a title or office to it, but the stewardship of being a Christ follower, somebody who gets it, someone who the Holy Spirit has convicted, somebody who you finally understand, I don't need a title or an office. I don't have to have any position. Nobody has to call me to anything by title. All I've got to do is live in my intersection and in my inadequacies cry out to God. And in my crying out to God, decide I'm going to stand faithful enough to have courage. I want to say one last thing, I guess, in this matter of the heart. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy. A woman named La Rosa Russell took in scores of special needs children, fostered many of them, adopted many of them. She was asked in a, in a major magazine as they interviewed her, what's the hardest thing? She said, there's two. She said, the one you'd expect, the second one you wouldn't. She said, the first is to convince these kids who were throwaways and not wanted that they really are love. She said, that's the first hard thing. But she said, the second hard thing is the voice of the critic. She said, I never expected that. She said, if I take these kids out to a park, she said, I'll get a letter afterwards that said, me, I, that said I didn't do it right, that I should have done something different, that they will criticize in some way. She said, if I take them to a restaurant, I'll get some kind of a comment or a card or some kind of an email that, that begins to criticize how I did it. And people on the outside are criticizing how I'm trying to love on these kids. And she said, I have sat in the middle of the night many, many times and bawled because the harsh voice of the critic if you're in leadership, part of what you're going to have is a thousand paper cuts. There's no place for arrogance for you not to learn things. There's no place for arrogance for you to, 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 to disregard what people would think or say. 
but there is a place for you to live with courage. And the voice of the critic is not what you live for. You're not playing for the crowd. Moses was accused of being arrogant. David is accused of treason. Jesus was accused of not being holy enough. Paul was accused of preaching for money. I don't know what kind of critic you'll get, but at some point in time, I've got to say I'm done with the poisons of leadership. I'm done with arrogance, and I'm done with cowardliness. And I want to live the two great antidotes. I want to live with humility, and I want to live with courage. Thank you.